All right. Hey. Yeah, give, give VBS a hand. It was fun to see a bunch of kids. There's 55 kids here running around all over the place, um, having lots of fun. I know some people uh, were a little comatose afterwards. Uh, they were really tired afterwards because it takes a lot of energy. And uh, it's a scary thing to be uh, teaching little kids. They're the... I think you've heard me say this before. I went before long before I started doing, um, the, before I was a full-time pastor, I was, I was also a substitute teacher. And the very first class they gave me was a kindergarten class. I'd never substitute taught before that. And um, I, before I gave my life to Jesus, I did a lot of crazy things. And I experienced a lot of scary things. Like I've been shot at. I've, done all, I've, I've, I've seen a lot of life. The scariest thing that I ever experienced in my life was being in that class with those kindergartens. It was terrifying. So kudos. Can we give it up for all the VBS staff that, were, that helped out? They did a great job. Love it. I love it. Hey, so we are, we are uh, in the middle of a series called Hijacked. Everyone say hijacked. And we are talking about words that sometimes are used in church, that we see in the Bible, that we see, that we use in church. And then, but, but some of the same words are also used outside the church. And sometimes they don't mean the same thing. And so we're trying to bring clarity and understanding to some of those words. We've talked about forgiveness. we talked about love. And so we're bringing clarity to some of these words. Today we're talking about the word Lord. Okay, that word, we see it all over the place. People use it all the time. Oh, my Lord, right? Something appalling happens. Oh, my God, right? Something, something exciting happens. Oh, my, you know, people, people use that word all, kind, all kinds of different ways outside the church and in the church, right? Obviously, within the ecclesiastical setting like this, we use the word, we, we pray, dear God or dear Lord, and then we pray we, or, or we sit down for, for lunch in a little bit. We're going to pray. We're going to say grace over our meal, and we use that, a lot of times we use the word Lord or God during that setting as well. But I think it's really important for us to, to go into what it means, what this word means, this word Lord, Right? I think when we talk about church, when we talk about God, we want, you hear, you hear me say this often, we, everyone wants a savior, but do we all want a Lord? And sometimes people are like, I don't know what that means, I'm not sure what he's talking about. And so I want us to, I want us to talk a little bit about that. We, we, all, want, we all want to receive uh, the benefits of heaven, but we don't all want to carry the responsibility of that. We all don't want to carry our cross sometimes, right? Do we, do we really want God to give us direction and instruction, right? That's what it means to have a Lord. He is my Lord. He is my king, and I am his servant. Do we want that, right? Everyone wants a savior who wants a Lord, okay? So when talking about this, um, again, I think, I think we as Christians, we sometimes minimize that word vastly. And so we're going to go to Philippians chapter 2. Actually, we could go almost anywhere in Scripture and begin to talk about the word Lord. But I, I chose this. This one stuck out, stood out to me, and I want us to look at this. But um, a really amazing book, uh, this letter that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. Um, it's super encouraging. Paul was in prison. He knew he was facing death. But you see this, this letter that is full of love and joy and gratitude. And it's all because his, of his closeness to the Lord. And so when we look at this, um, you'll, you'll see it kind of start to pour out a little bit as Paul pins these, these, these words to the church in Philippi and to us. So we're, we're going to start at chapter 2. We're going to work through verses 5 through 11. Um, we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit for a little bit in regards to this word Lord. Um, and then we'll, we'll let you go, guys go have brunch or lunch or whatever it is that you guys do, right? Some of you guys just... Do you get, any of you guys fast at, right after church? No. You guys go eat. Who's going to have some tacos after church? <laughs> boom, boom, boom. I love that. Anything else? Spaghetti? Nothing? I'm hungry already, just so you know. Okay. All right. Philippians chapter 2. Paul says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. 
Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay. I'm going to pray and then, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk about this. Father, um, we are so thankful for your grace and your mercy. And Lord, forgive me for times that I take your name in vain, that use your name in vain in what I say, think, and do. I take your grace for granted. Lord, I pray that we, we recognize the, the importance of, of calling you Lord in our lives. Lord, help us to dethrone the person that's sitting on that, the throne, the seat. The, the seat of our hearts, dethrone that person and place you there. Help us to fully surrender to you, not just on Sundays and not just in the morning when we're reading the Bible, but, but in all ways, in every way, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we see, we see Paul, he's writing, he says these words, he says, that the, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. What Paul is saying, he knows, he knows the, the Old Testament really well. He knows the Hebrew scriptures really well. And so he's recalling something that Isaiah said 700, 700 years prior to the birth of Jesus. And he's, he's pointing to that. He's saying this is what Isaiah was talking about. Jesus is what Isaiah was talking about. And, and he says this in, in uh, Isaiah says this in chapter 45. It says, let the world look to me for salvation, for I am God. There is no other. I have sworn by my name, by my own name, I have spoken the truth, and I will never go back on my word. Every knee will bend to me, and every tongue will declare allegiance to me. And the people will declare, the Lord is the source of all my righteousness and strength. And all who were angry with me will come to him and be ashamed. In the Lord, all the generations of Israel will be justified, and in him they will, they will boast. Okay, so this word Lord, if you see, it's, it's been highlighted there, and it's, it's actually capitalized in Scripture. If you go through your Bible, you'll see this word Lord throughout the Bible, throughout the Old Testament, it's capitalized. And the reason for that is because it's, it's actually talking about the word Yahweh, Anytime you see the word like this in your Bible capitalized, it's actually using, it's actually declaring the personal name of God, Yahweh. Everyone say Yahweh. Yahweh. And so, so when, when God introduced himself to Moses initially, he, said, he, he was referring to himself. He says, I, I am who I am. I am Yahweh. Right? I, that is the name above names. The, 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 the ancient Jews said, this is the Holy One of Israel. That is the name above all other names. And, he, and as, as people began to understand who God was, they wouldn't even, this, this name was so holy that they wouldn't even speak it. They would just write it out. And they would write it out with these letters, Y-H-W-H. And so how do you say that? Right? What, like, how do, you, how do you say that? How do you pronounce that? Well, when, when we're looking at this, and I, actually we'll go back to that in a second. Um, the reason why I'm talking about this is because as we look at God, when we look at the, this word, the Lord, it is so important. Every time you see it in the Old Testament, they're referring to Jesus. They're looking to Jesus. Whether they knew it or not at that time when they were penning these words, it, we know that as we look at scripture, it's, it's constantly pointing us back to Jesus. And so this is important because Jesus is Lord. He is the creator of the universe. And so Jesus, when, when, when God calls himself Yahweh, when, when we look at Jesus as Lord, we're, look, we're looking at the same thing. We're looking at the same person. So this word Yahweh, can everyone say, just say Yahweh real quick? Yahweh. Okay. Again, the way that it was, the way that it was pr pronounced or or written out, it's these these uh, Y H W H these letters, and 
the Hebrew people, they, they were trying to figure out, okay, what is God saying with this? Because it mimics breathing. And I, and I tried this. It was kind of weird. So, so if, you, if, you, if, you actually, if you actually breathe in, like go, go like this. That's what they were saying. Okay, it's kind of strange. When I, when I was thinking about this, this is kind of weird. This is, it, it, and, and I looked at different, different um, d- study resources, and they all point to the same thing. God wrote it into being. I don't know how he did this, but he said, this is my name, and every time you take a breath, you're going to be saying my name. I actually did this while it was super, super quiet. And initially, when you, hear, when you do this, when you go, it, it almost sounds like it, you can't hear it. But, but when it's really quiet and you're in a room by yourself and you breathe in, you, you can almost hear this. Yahweh. Yahweh. When you breathe in, when you inhale, and when you exhale. I know it kind of sounds, it sounds kind of weird, right? Kind of sounds strange. But... But I want us to think about this. Imagine this. The, the, the Israelites, they were trying to figure this out. They're like, wait, his name is what? Yeah. Wait. That's his name? And it mimics the breathing sounds that we have. Imagine this. The very first words that you ever spoke when you came out of your mother's womb was a name, the personal name of God. I think God intended that. Think about that. The last word that you will ever speak when you leave this earth, will be the name of God. His name will no longer fill your lungs when you leave this earth. I, I dare you, I challenge you to try it. When you go home, make, like be in the bathroom by yourself or something. Just try it. Actually, try it right now. Ready? One, two, three. Some of you actually said it, Yahweh. That was good. I, I appreciate that. But think about this. Whenever you sigh, what are the different reasons why we sigh? Sometimes we're worried. Sometimes we're sad. And we're like, man, we're, we're breathing in and breathing out the name of God. How, how many of us have been brokenhearted before? A lot of us, right? Some of us might be in that boat right now. Guess what we're doing? When, when we don't know what else to say, when, when, when we don't have anywhere else to go, and we're, we're t- tears are running down our face, hearts in anguish, we're calling on his name, whether we know it or not. And so this, this name of God, Lord, is not just a title. It's who he is. It's his personal name. That's, he is the creator of the universe. It's not like he's just trying to gain respect from us. It's like, this is what you're going to call me. No, this, he is God, the name of names. And whether we believe in God or not, there's going to be a day coming sometime soon, judgment day, where every knee will bow and every tongue will proclaim the name of Jesus. Jesus is Lord. And so when we think about this name, Lord, when we think about our Lord, there's this awe and reverence as we, as we approach him. There's this fear. Actually, in Proverbs 9, it says, fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. Now, a lot of times, I used to be confused when, it, when, when talking about this, but, but it's not talking about this, this dread, like I'm, 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 a, I'm really afraid of spiders or snakes. What are some of the fears that you guys have in here? So just call them out. Just, just raise, let, let me see. Who, what are you guys afraid of? Heights, children, there you go. Did someone say a horse? Oh, snakes. Bees, the government. Uh, okay. I am the Lord's servant. What else? He is my Lord. Right, because here's what happens. Everyone on the planet, and I mean everyone on the planet, we will be tempted to worship something. We'll either want to worship ourselves or we'll want to worship the world or an, an ideology, 
or, or we will want to worship Jesus. And sometimes there's a mixture. And that, that, that can be confusing. A lot of times with Christians, we have this mixture where we're worshiping Jesus, but then we're worshiping ourselves. And we're trying to balance, go back and forth between masters. And that makes it so difficult and confusing for ourselves and others around us. Right? So it takes boldness and courage to believe Jesus and declare Jesus to ourselves and to others. I sometimes say this and it's confusing to people, and I'll try, I'll try it again, but, but it's one thing to believe in Jesus, it's another thing to believe Jesus. Why, right? If, if, I'll make a distinction. To believe in Jesus, I, I believe in God. Anyone can believe in God and say, yeah, I know that there is a God. Even Satan does that, right? We see it in scripture. There's an engagement there. But, but not everybody trusts and follows God. Do we believe Jesus? When we talk about courage to believe Jesus and confess his name to ourselves and to others, it's about obedience and surrender. Here's the question. Is he the Lord of my life? I want you to ask yourself the question. Is Jesus the Lord of my life or am I, am I releasing control over to him? And I think a lot of us, we would say, yeah, I am, but... But are we really releasing control to him? If not, we're probably worshiping ourselves or someone else or something else or a different ideology. One thing I learned recently as I was just doing some studying, do you know that the word obedience or obey is not found in the Old Testament? If you look it up, if you look it up, you, you'll see it in the English, you'll see it, but, but it is not, that word obey is not in the Old Testament. The closest thing that you'd find in, in the Old Testament to obey is the word shema. That's the word listen, is the word hear. Right, Deuteronomy 6, in Deuteronomy 6 it says, listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Right, so obey is not an Old Testament word. Back then when they were writing this, there was no concept of that. They didn't have how they don't they didn't have the, the same thinking that we do. A lot of times when when we walk into a situation you, and, and and we're talking with people, I, I heard what you said and I'll consider it and I'll think about it, but I'm gonna ultimately decide with what I want to do with it, right? And that's our that's how we approach God with things. I heard what you said through your word. And I'll think about it and I'll I'll see what I'm gonna do with it. And the Hebrew people didn't do that. There was no difference between hearing and doing. The only evidence that you had that, that you actually heard is what, by doing. Because if I heard God say something, I'm going to do it. Are you hearing God? Are we hearing God? He is Lord. Is he Lord of your life? If we truly believe Jesus, our actions match that. Right, when we believe Jesus, it changes us. It changes us. It changes the way that we face our troubles. It changes the way that we love. It changes the way that we grieve. It changes the way that we do our finances and our spending and our giving. It breaks chains in our life. We recognize that we're not alone. Because we're deciding to say, to say okay, I'm, I'm going to walk towards God. I'm going to walk in surrender, with a surrendered life. I'm going to choose to live in his presence and in his likeness. And that takes boldness and courage. Is he Lord or are you Lord? The reality is that we, a lot of times we fool ourselves. And again, this, this includes me, okay? I say this often. I'm on a platform and I, I don't like it. Because I'm human, I'm just like everybody else. We fool ourselves, we, we, we show up on Sunday, we raise our hands in worship, and then do things that are contrary to who he is on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. Jesus is Lord on Sunday, but on Monday I am Lord. I put Jesus at the throne seat of my heart on Sunday, but then Monday it's a little bit different. Say, okay, give, give, me, give me the steering wheel back, Jesus. Right? His word is not a divine suggestion to us. And so we all have areas in our life where we're tempted to fail and we fail 
And it, it drives us to our knees and say, Lord, forgive me. And we repent. And we say, Lord, give me strength. I, I, give me, surround me with people that, that will help me and encourage me and keep me accountable. But then there's di- a different, okay, that's one thing. Right? That happens to all of us. But then there's, this dif- there's a difference between that and saying, I'm going to go party every weekend. And then I'm going to go to church on Sunday to feel better about myself. Right? There's this. I'm going to actively engage in this lifestyle, and then I'm going to go to church so I can feel better about myself. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to move in with my boyfriend or girlfriend because God knows that we love each other. And since, since we love each other, then he, God is love, and so it makes sense for me to do that, right? Right, that's, that's how, that's how and, we, and we begin to twist the truth and say, and we... We basically justify the things that we do sometimes and to, to live the way that we want to. So God's saying, are you Lord or am I Lord? Right? <laughs> kind of stings a little bit, doesn't it? I'm saying this to myself as well because I, I mean, as I wrote this, I'm like, man, there's areas in my life. Right? It's kind of like with the, with the Titanic. You guys hear the story of the Titanic. A lot of you guys know what that what happened with the Titanic, right? If you haven't seen the movie, um, spoiler alert, the ship sinks, right? <laughs> but what happened there was the crew and the captain, they were so confident in the design of the ship that said this thing is unsinkable. And they were, they were so confident about it and they needed, they wanted to, to make it there on time to, to New York. And so they just full steam ahead. And they were given warnings. They said, hey, there's icebergs along the way in that North Atlantic area where they were traveling through. And they said, you, be careful. You might hit something. They said, no, don't worry about it. And they full steam ahead. And it killed over 1,500 people. And we do that. I hear what you're saying, but I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to take whatever I want from this. I'm going to do whatever I want with it. Lord, forgive me for doing that. It's Jesus, Lord. Uh, There's a guy named Leonard Ravenhill. He says, this life is a dressing room for eternity. How we posture ourselves and how we, how we ready ourselves for, for heaven depends on what we, our yieldedness and our, and our surrenderedness to the king right here, right now. The most important thing that you and I can do will be to listen and obey to the Lord. That's the most important thing you and I will, will do. The most important thing will, be, will not be gaining success or how much money you get or even that your kids are good. That's not even the most important. The most important thing that you, we will do is, will I listen and obey to the Lord? Is he my Lord or am I? Right? And the only way to this boldness and courage is to draw close to him. Let's just say, Lord, you're the one that brings breath into my lungs. I'm going to draw close to you. It's not about impressing other people. It's not about trying to be spiritual, more spiritual than other people. It's about drawing close and being intimate with Jesus. That's why creating rhythms is really important. Right? A year is talking about this often. And Brooklyn and Josiah talked about Sabbath Sunday. It's these rhythms that are going to fill our spirit, right? A daily time with the Lord and in, in, in Bible and praying. Weekly time gathering together and, and also coming together and wrestling and grappling with, with God's word together with, with other individuals is, is part of our rhythms, small groups. Part of our rhythms is practicing Sabbath. And that's why we're doing this Sabbath Sunday is, is again, no, no church next week. We do it three times during the year. It's during the summer times, um, July, August, September, the first Sunday of the month. Um, and then we just... We don't just take a day off. We're intentional with our time and our thinking and our focus. We're going to spend some time in silence. We're going to spend some time dialoguing with other people about what God is doing in our lives. And then we're going to do do no screens. That one's hard. That's a hard one for a lot of people. Right? So this isn't just a day off of church and I'm going to go work on different projects or I'm going to do this or I'm going to go to a different church service. We've got to spend time alone. 
with the Lord. In Exodus chapter 31, it says, Be careful to keep my Sabbath day, for the Sabbath is a sign of the covenant between me and you from generation to generation. It is given so you may know that I am Lord who makes you holy. So it's important for us to take that time. That's how we draw strength from the Lord. We're called to declare Jesus to ourselves. We're, de- we're called to declare Jesus to a wor- the world around us as well. A world that hates Jesus. And I know that's a strong word. Some of you don't even use it in the, in the house because it's a bad word for you guys. But, but in John chapter 15, it says, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. This is Jesus saying this. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you are no longer part of the world. I choose you to come out of the world so it hates you. There's a world that hates Jesus. And we, sometimes we have this impulse to grab onto some, certain ideologies from this system that hates Jesus. And I'm not talking about certain individuals. I'm not talking about a, a certain group of people. I'm saying... There's a system that was created by principalities of darkness that hates Jesus and somehow has brought influence. The enemy, the enemy of, our soul, or of our souls is hell-bent on destroying humanity. So it, it captures the weakest parts of who we are for, its own, for his own advantage. And our weakness is the very thing that gives us the most strength as well. It's our freedom of choice. We were given by God this, this ability to choose who we love and we don't love. Whether we love, we, we can choose to love him and not love him. And in that choice, in that freedom of will, we have this endless ability as well to worship. He says, I'm going to give you a limitless ability to worship me. But at the same time, it opens us up to be able to worship other things. And so guess what? Satan knows this. And he says, I'm going to get them to worship something else, either themselves or someone else or something else or a, a different ide- ide- ideology. And so then we have, the, we have issues, for example, there's just a, a, a truncated version of this, but there's, the devil exploits that weakness in us and, and, use, and weaponizes empathy and, and, and compassion so that, again, so that humanity comes against itself. A great example of this was... Um, the opening ceremony of the Olympics. People would call it a piece of artwork, but when we look at it, it was a mockery of Jesus. People would say it was, it was no, it was, it, was, it was an act of compassion and empathy. We're inclusive, we're loving, and all these things, but it wasn't. It was a mockery of Jesus. And, my, and our response could be anger. It could be all kinds of different things. My response, at first I got angry, but then I, was, I grieved and sad. I looked at it, it was a modern representation of what happened to Jesus the day that he was crucified. He was brutalized, he was spat on, he was beaten. All these things happened to him. What does Jesus do? He says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. He loved them. And so this weaponization of virtues and empathy and compassion, what happens, it, it be, they become, they get spooled up and they become secular religions. And so then we have this, we have all these different types of alarmism and obsessions with, with different things like even, even climate change. People get super hyper-focused on that and it becomes a religion of its own. The wokeism, uh, this modern view of feminism. People latch onto things and they pour themselves into it as if they were pouring themselves into God. With this very ability to worship God, they say, I'm going to worship these other things and replace God with these ideologies. When we see this, people get their sense of purpose and meaning. They get their sense of worldview. They get their sense of right versus wrong, who the in crowd is and who the out crowd is, their sense of identity and who they identify with. It's secular religions. And it's it's driven by this impulse to say, I'm going to worship someone or something. And we end up worshiping, we end up worshiping other things other than who Christ is. But it takes boldness and courage to believe who Jesus is. But I love what Paul says. We're going to go back to Philippians chapter 2. I love what he says because 
This is who our Lord is. He says, everything is going to be okay. He says, everything, he says, I'm going to make all things new. I'm going to redeem all things. I'm, gonna, I'm going to reestablish things. Philippians 2, again, says, you must have the same attitude that of Christ Jesus. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. Then he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Think about this. In our loneliness, in our addictions, in our brokenness, Jesus says, I'm making all things new. I'm restoring things. We don't have to be afraid of what happens to us. We don't have to walk with fear of what's going to happen in this world or it's going to happen in November or it's going to happen next week. Because Jesus says, I'm making all things new. I want to fill your hearts with joy. So as we pray, as we seek boldness and courage to bend our knees to Jesus on a daily, on a daily basis, that he is Lord and I am not, that he is Lord and not any other ideology or this thing that I, that I think is going to bring me meaning and purpose, I know that I'm aligning myself with the bread of life, the way, the truth, and the life, the resurrection, the savior of the world. And the day is coming upon us when, when all people, again, all people will declare that Jesus is Lord, that he is Yahweh. Are we allowing him to be Lord of our lives? today? Are we allowing him to be the Lord of our lives tomorrow and the next day and the day after? Because it's one thing to say I'm going to be at church on Sunday. It's another thing to say I am, I'm his. And he, he calls the shots in my life. He leads me, he directs me, he molds me, he shapes me. And the only thing that we have to do is say I'm going to draw close to you Lord. Lord, help bring all the imperfection that's inside of me. Help me lay it down at your feet and make me more like you, Jesus. That's what he's calling us. Let's go ahead and stand up. We're going to receive communion in a little bit. I went way over. It's a little bit it feels like, um, I don't know, it feels a little, does it feel a little sad for you guys right now? You guys can be honest, it's okay. I typically want, when we come out of here, I want us to be full of encouragement and joy, but like sometimes truth hurts a little bit. And sometimes we, like, it's hard to hear the things that we need to hear sometimes. But you know what James says in James chapter 1? He says, count it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, which includes a sermon that isn't fun to listen to sometimes. Or he's saying, he's saying, hey, throw a party when you're troubled. Like, how many of you guys, are gonna, how many of you guys throw a fiesta when you're facing a hard time? Not very many of us. I don't, I, I always want to be like, please feel sorry for me. Like, right? You should see me when I have a cold and Laura's like, my wife's like, oh my gosh, poor, this guy, this guy needs some true help. But I want to say this, guys. I need to hear this. I think we all need to hear this. I think it's, it's I mean, God is calling us up. He's calling us up. He's saying, I want to be your Lord. Please, Anything that might be dethroning him off from your heart, he's saying, please let me out that. Because I want to bring you fullness of hope and fullness of joy and freedom. And that's why we talk about this stuff. He is Lord and he is good and he wants the best for us. 
He's calling you up. 